And that is okay. <laughs> oh, hello guys. Welcome to the Pink Daily episode number 12. As you can see, we've gone back in time and my webcam has reverted to a lower and much, <laughs> much more pixelated quality. The reason is we did find out our brand new webcam. We 100% checked it through troubleshooting that it was uh, basically interrupting other USB devices on my computer and it was causing my mouse to constantly, uh, basically probably once every 10 minutes, it would just kind of freeze up for a few seconds and it would cause my mic to disconnect as well. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Got to play a tournament on the weekend with that, not realizing what was going on, I was changing my mouse around. We've had the stream get interrupted all day yesterday and on Friday, but it's finally figured out and um, we realized we just need to buy a different webcam that's not crap and doesn't interrupt our, uh, our USB controller. Uh, tried upgrading our drivers and all that, but finally we figured it out and we're like, okay, just unplug it, plug the old webcam in for now and we can, uh, we can continue the show. <clears throat> So thank you guys for hanging out. It is the 31st of May, 2016, episode number 12. Yeah, pretty sure that's all right. Today we are going to be talking about how to beat a stronger player um, and also the same sort of vein as that. Uh, maybe you're not playing a tournament match against a rival or maybe you don't play with your friend that much. You, maybe you, you mostly play on ladder, but it's also how to make the game easier for yourself if you're having a hard time in a matchup. Um, and we're, we're going to talk about a few kind of ways you can go about that and as always you know the pig daily is not about saying this is how you should play starcraft it's always about hey here's a different way you can approach the game so when, it, when you run into a barrier and you're really up against the wall trying to play say some purely defensive macro style we're going to talk today about how to play a bit more aggressively without necessarily taking absolutely crazy gambles without going full cheese mode and uh, and trying to figure that out however before we do that i do have a quick announcement to make um First of all, don't be worried. I'm not going to be uh, quitting StarCraft as a content producer, but unfortunately, I've been I've been exploring myself a little bit recently, and I've kind of realized that there's other things out there that they just they just make me feel a lot happier right now than competing in StarCraft. Uh, let me just I, I'll just have to show you guys, you know, some of my recent experiences and why I'm going to be going pro in other games. This is uh... look at all these people play of the game coming out from Pig. Showing us he's not just a StarCraft player. Uh, let's see what this is. He doesn't have ulti available. Oh, he's oh, going to bow down some one, Roadhogs. They're lining two, up for him. Three, four. See you, mate. I love it. Oh, that, that was so good. So many fun plays. And that's why I'm becoming a pro gamer at Overwatch. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, what can I say guys, I went to the launch on the weekend, single-handedly destroyed everyone with the pure skill character Bastion. Apparently he's like, he's like Protoss in Overwatch, where everybody just hates him because he's too good and most people don't have the skill to play him. So, you know, I'm just uh, having a bit of fun playing, playing him and... <laughs> Um, yeah, of course, that was just me at the Overwatch Overwatch launch. Had a lot of fun there on the weekend. I do apologize for missing the daily yesterday. It's because we had a lot of fun there and we were very busy also playing the ANZ $1,000 Cup on Sunday, uh, which we ended up getting third place in. So that's actually the game we're going to be talking about. So enough screwing around. Let's actually hop into game and take a look at <clears throat> the replays. So we're talking about how to play against someone who's stronger than you. How to beat someone who's, is, you know, a stronger player than you. Let's, uh, let's put those health bars on damaged. Make that a little bit prettier for all you. Oh, yo. Let's turn those game sounds down as well. And there we go. So what happened in this series? This was the grand uh, the upper finals between myself and Iogaz. And, um, and yeah. Basically, we very quickly realized in this series, Ayagaz is a lot better player than us right now. A lot. And we just didn't have the fundamentals to take him on. So this was game one of our series where I was like, you know what, Frozen Temple, I have a really good Mutaling Bane build I play here. I think it's really strong. I think we can take this out. And we were going into it, we're like, let's play purely defensive, you know, macro opening. And this is my rule of one gas build. It's a very strong build order. It's really good. However, it is in that spectrum of I'm playing a very defensive opening. I'm putting the onus on myself to defend well. And what we're going to see in this replay is me just get outplayed by Iagos. So if we fast forward through it, 
<clears throat> let's just kind of take the the broad strokes reapers being annoying he kills a drone scouts everything we're kind of doing our standard take three hatcheries and uh what you've got to keep in mind as we kind of zoom through this replay as this is just kind of the beginning this is this is not the replay we really want to look at this is the replay where we realize like crap we need to do something different You've kind of got to think about um, whenever you are playing a macro style, it is the hardest way to play StarCraft. It's the best way to understand the game. It's the best way to f kind of fully understand how everything is implicated because you're playing so reactive. You're, you're all about defending, having a solid build order with set reactions. In this build, for instance, we can see we're getting up lots of queens. We're going up to about six queens, getting a spine crawler. We actually missed a queen on our natural. One of the many reasons this was such sloppy execution. But it's all about having a build which is generally pretty decent at stopping most things. But it's all based around scouting and then reacting hard in different directions once you recognize what your opponent's doing. And really going for that macro. We see in this game, for instance, looking to take that fourth very early. Hellion drop does come in. And if we just kind of zoom on forward... Basically, it's like, okay, we're both just macroing. Igaz does a bit of pressure. Very typical TVZ, right? Terran does a little bit of poking and prodding. But, you know, I'm just macroing on up. Nothing too crazy coming out of him. And then, by the time the first pressure comes, if you're both on an equal footing, you're both playing macro builds, nothing too crazy has happened, you should be able to stop this. And we just didn't. We just weren't ready at all. Um, you know, our Bane Lingness had just finished, but we actually thought it wasn't finished. We were so rusty. We didn't even morph Bane Lings here, even though we had Hellbats. He get, kills our Queen, our Spine Crawler, and we're just like, oh man, I'm so bad at this game right now. Oh no. And we were a little bit, a little, little bit annoyed. We we're like, man, you know, you should be able to hold this off just with Bane Lings. Should be able to play, play it out from there. And from here, we just kind of get spiraled out of control. I guess there's the standard drippy droppy be annoying this is a very late spire build so if you do mess up early then drop salt gonna be very annoying because you just don't have enough zerglings to be everywhere at once but uh yeah from here it's just kind of like one of these games where you get in that bad position so i'm just gonna lock this on my camera and we're gonna talk about it a little bit <clears throat> so this is also for people if you're playing a tournament or you're playing against a friend who, who you happen to pra practice against a lot or if you're playing against um even someone on ladder, maybe you're playing late at night and you keep getting matched with the same opponent or uh, when you get to the higher levels, that happens uh, a lot. Um, it's something where you want to start kind of adjusting to your opponents and thinking about how each other are playing and all that sort of stuff. But <clears throat> you also want to be gauging not just what your opponent's doing, but you also want to be thinking about how am I doing against my opponent? You want to be trying to think to yourself like, okay, how did I do that game? Was it just, oh, I lost because I didn't have Banelings? In this game, for instance, I said, oh, not having a Baneling Nest was huge, but I really felt like there was more to it than just not having Banelings when that first push came. I said to myself, I felt like I lost control of this game. I felt like I didn't execute a lot of small things well. I was slightly out of position for that Hellion drop early on. Felt like there was a few points where I had these slight supply blocks, which I don't normally have. All in all, I could sense that I wasn't playing my best StarCraft. And I already knew that Igaz is a really good player. So I kind of said to myself, like, man, I don't know. I don't know if we can keep playing this just very defensive macro style. Because there's no way worse to lose a series than when you're trying to macro and you're just executing really badly. And they just kind of, like, attack when they attack. And they just have a bit more stuff than you. And you're just steadily getting pushed back. And you're not really taking any risks. And then suddenly you're, you're getting overwhelmed. And that's exactly what we kind of experienced in this game. It's this feeling of helplessness. And if you do feel really helpless in a, in a macro game when you haven't really made any massive mistake, I feel like it's something where I just kind of said to myself, look, this isn't working out. We're, we're doing everything we can here to come back, but it's not going to happen. And I said, look, I think we need to do something a bit different. I think we're playing someone who's stronger than us right now. He's very favored. We've been, uh, you know, been... been off practicing our Protoss and Terran and generally getting overwhelmed quite a bit. So we're, we're just kind of in that point where like, uh, things, things aren't looking too good for us. So whenever you're facing someone who's just a bit stronger than you in a macro game, and likewise, what if it's not just, what if this is for you to apply in your own experiences on ladder? I'm sure there's people who are like, yeah, I don't really play against the same people that much. I just play on ladder. In that case, when are you going to apply what we're going to be talking about here? I think the best time 
is when you're struggling in a matchup. So think about it. <clears throat> Sometimes people really try to learn the macro game. They try to learn to be solid and react to what their opponent's doing and all that good stuff. But then they just struggle. They'll have one matchup which is just so bloody hard to get a handle on. They just can't seem to get on top of it. And well, as much as I advocate, try to try to learn your macro. You know, just try to refine it. Try to focus on the little things to get over that hump. Sometimes you hit a point where you're just at that. You're just like, no, nope, we're done trying to like just play purely defensive in this matchup. It's too hard. It's clearly our weak spot. We need to make the game easier for ourselves. And that's exactly what we said here going into game two, and what we decided was a few things we want to put into action. Number one, we want to throw our opponent off their game. Okay, so we want to do something a bit weird. All right, that makes sense. What else do we want to do? Number two, we want to create space for ourselves. Okay, so give ourselves a bit more room for error. Don't just be sitting back trying to receive aggression because there's so much less room for error, right? If you're just purely defensive, you make one mistake, there's, there's no time to recover. He's already at your base. So that kind of ties in with the next point, which is be aggressive put the pressure on him, and likewise, try to force mistakes out of my opponent. Make sure he has to respond to a hard situation. Now, the most basic way you're going to see this put into action in a game is normally someone saying, he's better than me, I'm, I have to all in him. I'm going to go kill him with a cheese. And that's valid. That definitely can totally close a skill gap between two opponents. You take a gamble, say, I'm going to go for this big all in. I mean, if he, if he opens banshees or something, like, it'll stop it, but... If he doesn't open Tankyvac or Banshees, I think it's got a really good shot of winning, as long as he doesn't scout it. You can take risks like that. But what we're going to talk about is a, a less kind of all-in, complete gambly way of doing it. So let's dive on into game and let's take a look at what we do in this game. So what we're going to decide in this game is, like I said, we want to put aggression onto our opponent and we want to force him to react to what we're doing. Early on, I was thinking to myself, well, I'm playing at a, a pretty high level here. Ayagaz is a very good opponent. Um, you know, he did make it to the, the top 16 of 332, uh, of uh, <laughs> the top 16 of the round of 32, the top 16 of spring. Um, you know, he had a reasonably close set with uh, with Violet there as well. So I was kind of thinking to myself, like, okay, we, we want to get under his skin. We want to do something he hasn't seen that much. And it doesn't matter necessarily if you're doing looking for something purely creative. You can do something that, you know, you've seen before. As long as it's something which isn't necessarily what every other player is doing on ladder right now. Because that just makes it easy for your opponent to respond. So normally you want to say to yourself, the more out there, the more different the style I'm going for, the more unexpected it is, the harder it's going to be for my opponent to actually respond to it. So I want to be looking for something that's going <clears> to <throat> find a unique way to put pressure on my opponent. Now, even if there's other players out there doing, say, a pool first, you could go pool first, run some Zerglings across the map, like dodging the Reaper, try to delay the command center on the low ground. It could be something as simple as that. What I really like, though, is the idea of having multiple waves of that awkward aggression. And this is something we're going to kind of come back to in the third game as well. We want to have the idea of we don't just want to surprise our opponent once. <clears throat> we want to surprise them multiple times. We want to maximize our chances of them misreading and making mistakes by hitting them with multiple weird aggressive timings. So the idea is <clears throat> we're saying you need to react a very specific way to not take a lot of damage from this weird step. And then we hit them again a little bit afterwards with something which takes advantage of that. Let's fast forward and take a look at this specific build. So this is a really weird build which I saw someone do on a Korean ladder to me on Ruins of Endion, the Rock Tower maps in ZVZ. Basically, it's a hatch gas pool, but you don't build a queen in the main base and you just go straight for lair. Already we're seeing this is a little bit crazy. It's a bit strange. But since we're getting six Zerglings out and this queen hit the natural, as long as the Reaper doesn't make it into the main base, he's going to have no idea what's going on. So notice we bring our lings down the front and we start dancing knowing that most of the time, if the lings are already out, the reaper's not going to try and dive into the main until a little bit later on. We're just going to queue up another queen from our natural. And even though we hadn't practiced this build a lot, we just felt like it was such a good idea to do because it's such an, an awkward, super fast muter timing. But <clears throat> a lot of the time, the opponent doesn't realize that that's even a possibility. So we're going to be getting a second gas as well, nice and early, about 2 minutes 50. We could have got that even slightly faster. As you can see, we don't quite have 200 gas when our lair finishes. 
<clears throat> one of the great things though about doing these sort of builds is as long as you understand the tenets of the build, even if you're a little bit disorganized in how you execute, for instance, where supply blocked here on 36 and our second gas was late and our spire was slightly late, despite all of those things, you're going to be putting so much pressure on your opponent that you've got so much more room for error. Now, if I had actually practiced this build before, I've done it once, maybe twice on ladder, never written down the build order, and didn't, didn't really study it closely. But if we'd done all that, <clears throat> our build would be so much more efficient. Right now, in this build order, we'd be looking at way more stuff. Let's change those hotkeys over so we can bring up those correct overlays. So we'd be looking at having quite a few more drones, just a bit of a smoother opening. But what we're already thinking about is just getting these fast as possible muters out. And it is only now <clears throat> that unfortunately we had our Zerglings out of position, our Queen out of position. The Reaper's going to come in and he is going to see, oh, what the hell? You're going for an insanely fast spy. That's almost done. And you got to think about what does Terran actually have to respond to this? <clears throat> he just started his CC as he saw this. And he's got a factory with a tech lab. He's got a Widow Mine drop coming, but he doesn't have any real production, doesn't have an engineering bay, and those muters are going to be out very soon. So <clears throat> whenever you can hit them at an awkward timing, you force a bigger response. The faster, the harder you hit someone, the more they're going to have to cut some corners to kind of get enough defense out. We're seeing Igas here say, okay, I'm going to get two more barracks, get some marines out, but he's also knowing very quickly in the back of his head, he knows he needs to get out an engineering bay very soon and get up some missile turrets. He's actually banking right now on this drop, keeping us back and trying to stop us from getting across that map to harass. Because if those muters were able to go straight across the map here, he would be in massive trouble. Of course, realizing that we've skipped Zergling speed, <clears throat> that's going to slow down our ability to deal with this a lot. But we're going to come down here, just, just defend, not get too fancy with it. <clears throat> going to be a bit of a skirmish, bit of Miss Micro, losing a muter on the Widow Mine. He does focus down one more Mutalisk. But that's all right, we needed to fight there. And he will lose a medevac, all of his marines and a widow mine, as well as a siege tank for it. Now this is the point <coughs> where you've already got to have a plan in place. We're talking about trying to hit with waves of aggression, trying to come and surprise your opponent. So remember, it's not just about having a single wave. I really like the idea of let's attack with one specific timing. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. But the moment you hit with that, or the moment you've even committed to that first group of units, in this case, it's going to be seven mutalisks. That's it. Seven mutalisks as fast as we can possibly get them. But behind that, we're not just continuing to build mutalisks. We're not continuing to build units. We're actually going to do a roach swap. We're going to hit with roach ravager. Now, the reason we're doing this is we're going to be talking about the idea of forcing something from your opponent, really trying to force your opponent into a certain situation. And the reason this makes the game so much easier for yourself is if you think about it, if you force your opponent to do something, you already know the next step to counter their reaction. So in this case, what we're going to see, and I'll show you in game in a moment, <clears throat> is Mutalisks force Liberators. They force lots of Marines, Widow Mine focus, because the last thing a Terran player is thinking of against a player who's open Muters is let's get siege tanks out. Siege tanks are not that great against mutiling bane. They're not necessary. Bio mine liberators much stronger against mutiling bane. However, <clears throat> where we know that's that's what he's going to be focusing on. We know these muters are getting in at such an awkward timing. They're going to be able to fly around and dance about, causing damage in big reactions. So we're thinking, well, if we can just distract him, cause damage, throw him off, we can then follow up with a big roach timing. So let's hop back into game. And we can show how this is going to work. <clears throat> and like I said, this is a build we kind of made up on the spot. It's not crazy refined. But you can see, even as the muters are out, we're already dropping the Evo Chamber and the Roach Warren. These muters are coming in here, trying to do what they can. Obviously, he's had plenty of warning because of that Reaper. He's decently, decently locked up. But we're just going to keep flying through the base. And behind this, we're droning up our third base as hard as possible. Flying Mutalisks through the missile turret like a real pro gamer. And we're just going to drone up and go for that big roach timing. These muters just picking up whatever they can, being as annoying as possible. <clears throat> and you've got to think about this from your opponent's point of view. We were saying how Ayagaz, you know, he's not going to know exactly what's going on necessarily. So he's pumping out Widow Mines, Liberators, Marines. 
we're trying to just keep being annoying with these muters as much as possible. And if we put this on his camera, he doesn't really know what's going on. Now, funnily enough, after this series, um, or well, actually it was, it was into his series in the grand finals, where he tweeted saying that, he's like, bloody hell, after Zerg's open two base muter, I'm three, three games out of three. I've scanned afterwards to try and spot the Roach Warren or Roaches popping out, and I've missed it. Every single time, I've scanned the wrong hatchery. I, uh, I haven't caught the roaches popping out. And as a result, he's not been ready for these roach follow-ups. But already you can see that if Terran's forced to rely on a single scan across that map to try and figure out what's happening behind this, it makes it very difficult for them to be fully ready for what's going on. Meanwhile, we've droned up to mostly saturating our third base. So it's basically just, I don't know, 2.7 bases saturated, two and a half bases saturated, whatever you want to call this. And we're gearing up for that huge roach attack. So all we've done this game is we've found a unique way to rush up to those mutalisks really fast. And it doesn't have to be a mutalisk. Remember, if you're a Protoss player, it could just be a way of hitting a really fast blink pressure, a faster than normal Oracle. If you're playing Terran, it can be doing, uh, you know, a fast Reaper pressure early on, Proxy Reaper. You can do something like that you can go for a fast, uh, faster than normal Hellion drop. There's so many pressures available to each race. We just want to remember, theoretically, what are we thinking about here and how does it apply to all races? It's just the idea of some sort of fast harassment unit getting out as quickly as possible to occupy our opponent, potentially do a lot of damage, even though that didn't happen this game. And then whatever they're forced into kind of over committing to against that, whatever they're forced into reacting to, if possible, you want to try and react against that. In this case, we go pure bio liberators. These units are really not good against roaches and ravagers unless they've got the siege tanks supporting them. Because without the siege tanks, the roach ravager outranges bio. It outranges widow mines and it outranges liberators until they have range. Which means that roach ravager can just engage from afar, use those corrosive biles to zone out the bio, and the bio will almost never be cost efficient unless it's got like a full surround where Corrosive Bile can't come into effect. Now let's go back to thinking about how does this make the game easier for us? We're doing some pretty intense Mutalisk Caress here. Remember, you don't need to do such crazy Mutalisk Caress. And not that this is crazy by any means, but if you're in, if you're in Bronze League uh, or Gold or Silver or something, you might be looking at this Mutal Harass and thinking like, whoa, this is like really active on the Muters. The thing is, you only need to be as annoying to your own level with them. Let's keep in mind, what has this simplified for us? Going for these mutalisks, literally all we did once the muters were out was build a handful of drones for our third, put on gas, and all we've done since then is start these upgrades and do injects and build roaches behind it. There's no fancy macro, there's no taking new bases. All we've done is just inject, inject, build roaches, build overlords. Okay, harass with my muters a little bit. Inject, inject, build overlords. Let's look at that rhythm one more time from my camera. And you can see that because there's no opportunity for my opponent to respond to me, look at how easy and calm I can do this. I just finished a macro cycle then, so my muters are going to come in. All right. Mm, not really much to hit. Let's just fly those away. All right. Let's... Uh, not much to macro at home. Notice we can see here in my bottom display bar what I'm clicking on. All right. Let's see. Let's pick off a, uh, an SCV or two. Okay. That's nice. All right, getting a couple SCVs. Okay, his units are here. Just gonna pull those muters back. And now we're just kind of building more roaches, building more overlords. Inject, inject, roaches, overlords. We barely even need to look at our base. All we need to look back to do is inject. So notice we look back at our base there quickly, but we can keep queuing up units without even looking at it. Notice down here at the bottom, you can see me just doing it nice and quickly. Of course, you don't need to be quite as fast at that and you can still get it done. But whenever there's no pressure on you, it becomes much easier to do a lot of things at once. You can both harass and macro really quite easily, especially if you're doing this sort of non-committal harass. Each time I go in with these mutalisks, I'm not looking to get game ending damage. I'm looking to snag an SCV or two, be annoying, force a reaction, and then pull out of there. That's all I wanna do. Just continuing to inject, continuing to build units. It's a very basic focus. We don't feel stressed at all. We don't feel like, I've got to get damage done right now. And that's why it does make the game so much easier. Whenever you're putting the aggression on, whenever you're the one with the tech advantage, you're the one with the mobility advantage, 
you're the one who's attacking, the game does become a hell of a lot easier than just defending. So, <clears throat> this is sort of playstyle is fantastic if you're struggling in a matchup. You don't need to respond to drops in three different locations. You don't need to defend here and there while counter pressuring. It's literally just poke around with muters while macroing up, and then we get a huge army out, and we're going to attack with it. So, <clears throat> I really do feel if you put these styles into into place, um, they can they can make the game a hell of a lot easier for you. Once we do engage, notice we can just spam these corrosive biles across his army, and he's forced to engage right on into our Roach Ravager, which is a pretty dream scenario for uh, for Roaches and Ravagers. A bit poor micro for me, letting all those Widow Mines uh, fire there. But as we said, Liberators just aren't very good versus Roach Ravager. We're just microing around so that we can corrosive bile all these units. If there's a few siege tanks in the back, I can't do this dancing back and forwards. But because I have the range advantage, I can constantly reposition as much as I want. Every second that goes by, there's more corrosive biles. And look at that. He tries to actually say, no, you, you can't keep dancing out of range of me. Eats corrosive biles. And we're able to push on in here and use that tech advantage. Now, if there was just two tank evacs out, he could sit back here, try to force me through this choke point, use tank evacs on the rear have massive splash damage. It's not like I was ahead in army. I may have been up in supply, but remember these are poorly upgraded, just plus one Roach Ravager. There is no depth to my army. There's no sort of, oh, late game follow-up composition. This is, in many regards, a sort of all-in follow-up. Now, we were talking earlier about how you don't need to go all-in. And that's true, I could, have, I could have macroed out of this. I definitely had options available, but you always can choose whichever way you want to play. In this particular scenario, we chose, let's go all in. We think, because we saw with our muters there was no siege tanks building, we recognized, you know what, I think we've got a great tech advantage. I don't think his army is going to be able to fight ours. And we took that decision to push in here. There was a very long fight here where we just kept on spacing those corrosive biles out, making sure his army couldn't engage properly on us. Of course, aiming on the medevax is also very important. Make your opponent worry, not just about their bio, but also their medevac spreading out. <clears throat> and if you ever need to retreat and group up, that's fine, because remember, your composition's always going to be more effective than theirs. Just got to keep some Ravages alive at all times, and the bio loses its real power. Notice it's very scary when the bio really closes in. But just using those corrosive biles to punish every time the bio tries to stim on top of the Roach Ravager works out incredibly well. And let's fast forward from there. Not too much to say, it's just the same micro over and over again. And that does end up closing it out there. GG's. Alright. <clears throat> so that was... Uh, that was game number two. And we managed to find some ground in a series where I really did fail even in that game. Remember we pointed out we supply blocked. Our Spire wasn't the absolute fastest it could have been. We still feel like Iogaz was outplaying us there in terms of so many areas of the game, so many fundamentals. We were still playing against a player who was fundamentally stronger than us. However, we put pressure on him. <clears throat> and while he didn't make any drastic mistakes, just that one compositional error of not properly kind of counter scouting didn't get lucky with his scan that he dropped to see that I was going roaches. And he simply didn't have the siege tanks in the composition that he needed. Something as simple as that made that game so much more difficult for him. And it gave us the, the potential to win without executing a perfect game, without playing any sort of crisp, beautiful, precise play. We weren't able to sit there and react to absolutely everything that happened in the game perfectly, but we were able to win nonetheless. <clears throat> Keep in mind, what were the main points we talked about there? We managed to find a unique way to put pressure on our opponent. So there's more, more chance of them kind of freaking out and being like, whoa, what's happening? And just focusing on their defense. And that means it's harder for them to scout. We talked about this in our, our last daily, actually, about, you know, the hidden advantages of aggression. Basically, it's just the idea of it's hard for them to scout if we're putting a lot of pressure on. Okay. Now, the next step is, <clears throat> the next reason is because it's more awkward or hits faster. It's hard for our opponent to gauge. We talked about trying to hit unique timings or things that throw them off. 
without necessarily going all in. Because it's very hard for our opponent to gauge, wait, is this just the precursor to an all in? Is there just a big attack coming behind this? Or are you macroing up behind it? And as long as you keep the pressure up, it's very hard for them to figure out which. And so there's a very high chance they're going to go for a very vanilla response, a very predictable response. And that's what we talked about there. Now, in every situation in the game, you can't always take advantage of that vanilla response um, in like the, the most compositional manner, but you can always take advantage of it either in timing or composition. So say you're a Protoss player and you're putting a lot of pressure on a Terran player with Blink. If you get a bunch of damage done and suddenly you're forcing him to put down bunkers and, and build more units and so on, if you get that little bit of edge early on to the point where your opponent is shit scared and is like, ugh, and really kind of locking himself down against this, uh, this blink timing or even a big adept timing, then you can actually transition out of it and you can't say, well, I've forced him into bio. Sweet. That's pretty rare for TVP. Terran always opens bio. It doesn't change anything compositionally, but you can force them to kind of over defend, right? To over commit to that defense so that you can be a bit greedy behind it and you can still take advantage of it in, in one way or another, or you can still kind of s jump up a step in your tech and kind of say, well, yes, you're going bio, but it might change the timings at which he gets things. So you know what? I feel like because his factory was actually delayed because of this pressure, he was building widow mines out of his factory. His starport was delayed. Um, we can say to ourselves, all right, he's actually not going to have medivacs out or not very many medivacs. And of course, the slower the medivacs, the slower the liberators. So we're going to have a bigger window before Terran gets to that critical mass of liberators, which are going to really cause us trouble. So we can say, all right, well, we're going to really aim to like take a fast fourth and try to take a lot of fights in that period before he can get his liberator count out. So whenever he comes out on the map, we want to be trying to take fights by having a, like a mass adept stalker army, something like that. Really trying to just adjust to what you're forcing out of your opponent, whether it be through timing or through composition. So you're either adjusting the timing they're getting units out at, the timing that like the, the, the direction they're going. I know that's a bit of an abstract concept, which is why I'm like, I'm trying to think of like a better way to explain this, but I think that about, about covers that. Or you're simply pushing them into a composition which they didn't want. In that case, it's just having widow mines rather than siege tanks really cost them. So we're gonna go into this third game and we're gonna look for the same sort of game in a different manner. We're gonna try and find another way of putting our opponent kind of off balance, forcing mistakes, forcing him into something uh, where he's not ready for what we're doing next. So let's jump on into game and take a look at it. So this one was Ruins of Endion. And <clears throat> to be honest, like we said in that previous game, we hadn't really practiced that build much before. And we kind of considered doing it in this game as well. We're thinking to ourselves, like, should we just do the same thing? Should we try and go out there with a bit of a, a weird strategy? And, um, and do it. I'm like, you know, he saw it before. I don't really want to do the same thing two games in a row. So what we're going to open up with instead is Railgan's ZVT3 Roach opening. And this is fantastic if they don't SCV scout usually. Um, so we're kind of taking a bit of a gamble this game. Uh, definitely felt like I, uh, I was pretty outplayed in game one. Didn't feel like I played the previous game even that, that amazingly. So I was like, you know, what, we, I, think, I think we still need to take a gamble. If you're watching on YouTube, there'll be a pop-up on screen right now with uh, Railgan's build. If you're watching on Twitch, literally just, just Google Team Liquid Railgan CVT. It'll pop up. It's just a really cute pressure opening. So in this build, the way this seeks to throw our opponent off guard is... Uh, even if they do SCV scout, often they don't hang around long enough to see the Roach Horn go down. But basically we've gone pool, hatch, gas. A bit of a weird kind of opening for ZVT. And we immediately go into two Zerglings to go straight across that map. And the idea is they're going to try and dodge the Reaper and then run into the natural and delay that command center. Unfortunately for us, Igaz is paranoid. Maybe because we played a bit weird last game and has decided to put his command center on the high ground. Notice as the Reaper comes across... Our lings are just skimming by the top and they're going past. And the idea is normally those lings, they're going to force the reaper home, right? Because he's going to be like, oh crap, my command center is going down, I'm exposed. And that's going to distract him from scouting. So notice here, he sees these zerglings with that marine. Could have got that marine but behind those depots actually. A bit sloppy by him. So his reapers come home. All he's seen is that we have a late hatch. All he knows is that it's pool first. So you go for three roach pressure behind this. 
And the idea is it's a very light pressure. It's just to distract and throw your opponent off, delay mining on their natural, be as annoying as possible. But it's nothing fancy, it's nothing overcommitted. But already, we're seeing this idea of waves of aggression. A way of putting pressure on our opponent. And if they make a mistake, if they panic a little bit and say, oh, it's just Zerglings, let's just build production facilities, not build any units. Suddenly your roaches can rock up and they can cause so much chaos. In this scenario, luckily for Igaz, he's building Hellions. You might think, oh, Hellions aren't good against roaches though, but when you've only got three roaches, literally anything that shoots will, will get the job done. So Hellions actually works out okay for Iagaz here. But behind this, we're already thinking about the next step. So remember, the idea is to catch him off guard with the Zerglings, which distracts him. It, it lowers the chance of him realizing the roaches are coming, the roaches are attacking. Both of these are very small non-committal steps. Just getting two Zerglings a bit earlier than normal doesn't slow down your economy that much. Just getting three roaches out doesn't slow down your economy all that much. It's still a, a pretty decent commitment. We're just trying to be as annoying as possible with these roaches. But what are we doing behind this? What the hell? He's still barely getting his natural landed. We're fighting down there. We're being as annoying as possible. And our lair's already almost finished. So once again, we're saying, let's swap into something else. In this case, you show roaches and then you swap into muters. As opposed to the previous game where it was just rush up to muters really fast. In this game, we're saying, okay, let's do it slightly differently. Unfortunately, because that roach pressure got cleaned up a little bit more handily than it normally does, and there's a lot of Hellions out, we're having to spend a little bit more gas on roaches, which is going to delay our Spire by about 20, uh, 20, 25 seconds. But these roaches will keep us safe. We'll get that Spire down. And even though we haven't done any drastic damage, I do feel like this is not a bad situation. So check this out. 33 drones versus 34 SCVs. You might think, oh, that's pretty bad for Zerg, isn't it? It's, it's really not. Because you've got to think about how Terran production works. Look at this. Barracks. Second barracks just going down. No engineering bays down. Tech Lab's just out in the factory. What do we actually have that gives map presence and pressure for, for the Terran? All we have is a Medevac, five Hellions, a Marauder, and two Marines. So even though he's playing very economically, keep in mind we're going to have our full map control soon with Mutalisks. And yes, our third got delayed there a bit more than it should have been, but we are ahead in workers <clears throat> and we are going to be kind of powering up in that economy very shortly. So this is actually quite a fine position because the Terran production takes so long to get up because we forced all those units to be built out. He doesn't really have those extra barracks. He doesn't have those upgrades. And this is something you always have to keep in mind with Terran, even though he's got fantastic tech. Our tech is online, in line with it. We've got that Spire, and we should, that should make us okay. Unfortunately, this is where we start to just make human errors, some bad execution mistakes, and we react really slowly to what's going on. This Hellion drop comes on in, and even though we react quite quickly, it's a little bit too slow, and then we show some really poor micro here. So our roaches, we actually just A-moved there, and we weren't watching them, so they were a little bit slow to get over here. And we're actually going to lose about 12 workers, which is just brutal at this stage of the game. We had all the units we needed to defend this. We were just a little bit surprised because we, we so rarely see Hellion drops, even though we did see it in game one. And we get caught out and take massive damage there. If it wasn't for that, we'd actually be in an okay position in this game. Absolutely. We see back here at home, once again, let's think about what Iga sees. He actually did spot the Spire. I don't think he... Either he realized... Let me see. Did he realize... Okay, yeah, he's building Liberators. He did realize he's just trying to be super greedy, skimp on the turret, skimp on the anti-air, which is the right call. Considering he killed that many drones, he knows there's not going to be like nine Mutalisks coming across the map, followed up with constant Muta reinforcements. So I guess he's making the smart call here. He's saying, all right, let's delay those turrets. <clears throat> this turret on the production should have still been down earlier. But once again, we get in there and we start being annoying. We start doing damage. We start being as frustrating as possible. Unfortunately, at the same time, once again, a huge sloppy mistake and another 10 drones go down. And this is just us not playing very well. As we said, our form wasn't very good. Look at... Also, this is like the most godlike medevac path of all time. Just like barely dodging my overlord. Then he picks up and comes back through the overlord vision and we don't notice it until it's killing drones. So this was just a, a really bad... Uh, Human error by me. But if we think about the way the build works, despite, like taking this damage should never happen. You should never take damage when you're doing an aggressive tech build. There's no excuse for it because you've got the units out. There's 
no way they should be able to put it on you unless you don't have proper map vision or you're not watching your minimap as was our case there. But look at this damage we're getting done. We're killing SCVs, we're droning up behind us despite all that damage, we're at 50 drones. He's on 47 SCVs. <clears throat> if you think about it, we, if we didn't lose all those workers, 24 workers, we would be over 70 workers right now pumping non-stop units. Our 1-1 upgrades would have already started 30 seconds ago probably. Like our, our whole base would be going so well. Our fourth hatchery would be on the way. Because we've just thrown wave after wave of surprising aggression at our opponent. And if they don't deal with it just perfectly, <clears throat> it really does make them suffer. And these muters just have so much value. Remember, they hit at such a timing that your opponent can't afford to just get out five liberators or have 20 marines on the edge of each base. I think Iagos definitely is a bit lazy not getting marines up here sooner. But in total, we are picking off SCV after SCV after SCV. And it makes it very difficult for your opponent to respond. <clears throat> so let's just fast forward from here, take a look at how the rest of this game goes. Definitely that damage at that crucial point on all those drones. Remember, I lost those drones when I was only on about 40, 45 drones, and a lot of those were mining gas. So losing 10 drones at that point is, is pretty brutal. And we start just massing up roaches. <clears throat> I think definitely it would have been an ideal scenario to hit another big roach ravager timing, because even though there's tanks out, there's only two, and there's just not that many medevacs. Once again, Iagas, I think, overbuilds liberators. Imagine if we were at 180 supply right now, we just kind of YOLO'd across the map. He's only got two medevacs, he can't evacuate everything. And I'm pretty sure that would be a, a very good position for Zerg. Once again, <clears throat> because you're throwing the kitchen sink at your opponent in terms of waves of aggression, each that forces a very specific response, and also things which your opponent hasn't played against a lot, things which your opponent isn't used to playing against, that doesn't necessarily understand how it works. And despite all that damage we take, we took all those small execution errors. If we watch how this goes towards the end, it's still a very close defensive battle. And our hive is finished, so we could have gone for Great Aspire and Broodlords very soon afterwards. Let's watch how this fight goes. Unfortunately, 2-2 for Terran's about to finish. Missed the third bile there on that siege tank. But we're going to come in now. <clears throat> Quite a big arc. Land some killer fungals. Really bad comping by Iagos there, which is why this was as close as it was after that early damage. I think if there were four or five siege tanks or a bit more bio, maybe this looks completely different. As it was, he still does overwhelm, but definitely had the potential to overwhelm even better there. Terran Imba! <clears throat> Alright! <clears throat> so that's the end of that game. So let's talk about a few of the points. Uh, by the way, guys, we're not we're not finished just yet. We'll, we'll keep looking in the game. But I do want to say, shout out any questions at x5 underscore pig tag in chat. Um, do put those out there. We don't have an Abathur code to give away today, but we may have a few more soon. So um, hopefully tomorrow. <clears throat> let's have a, a little drink of tea quickly. <clears throat> My throat is like 90% better um, compared to last week where I was going Ugh, the whole week, but uh, we're still getting there little bit by little bit. So <clears throat> in terms of what happened in this game and, and these games, let's go back and think about it. Game number one, we were, we were defending, right? We were kind of like, all right, defend, defend, macro, macro. And against an even player who's playing as well as we were, that would be fine. That would be a great way to play. It'd be very reactive. We realized... We we're playing a player who's stronger than us, and therefore we needed to play a bit different. As we said earlier on, if you guys are struggling in a matchup, you can't keep up with Terran. Whether you're a Zerg, whether you're a Protoss, if you're Terran, you can't keep up with Protoss. Whatever matchup it is, if you're ever struggling in a matchup, one of the best things you can do is start to think of how to play in this sort of style where you're putting the onus on your opponent to make mistakes. It's never going to be 100% solid. Aggression always comes with its gambles. There's always certain things that happen to just, just wreck it. They happen to destroy it. But <clears throat> what you're going to be doing 
is really opening up space for yourself to make errors, as we said earlier. Let's go back in this game, and I really wanna wanna think about it. Just in fast forward, from from like literally the very beginning of the game, and what I want us to look at is in terms of pressure. Who has pressure on them throughout this entire game? The Reaper makes it as far as my natural before he turns around. <clears throat> Already, there's pressure on the Terran. There's pressure on my opponent. Okay. Cool. Clear that out. Scouts around. Oh. Here come three roaches. Once again, pressure. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Non-committal. <coughs> it's just one initial commitment and then into economy behind it. So it's always pressure and then economy behind it. Pressure, economy behind it. And we're always taking up and preparing for the next step. The speed, there's two slow zerglings, just two small zo slow zerglings, followed up by three roaches. Now, there's always going to be points where you then shift back into being defensive, like right now. Suddenly, we're on the defense again. However, we've got roach tech. <clears throat> we build three or four roaches here, four roaches. And all we have to do is aim move those roaches. And once again, he has to be somewhat frightened of the potential for us to go across that map and just A move him with a whole bunch of roaches. Us, on the other hand, we have absolutely no fear of him attacking us. It's just a few Hellions, a single unupgraded Marauder, and a Reaper. We know he doesn't have a lot of production behind this. We feel very confident. And even though he still can hang out on the map, there really is no pressure on us right now. It's even. We're not pressuring him at this moment, <clears throat> but we're gearing up for that next stage of pressure, that Spire. Obviously, you can't have pressure on your opponent at every single stage of the game, but the vast majority of it you can. Now, this is where we did make the mistakes in this game. In the very narrow window where we were meant to be defending and the pressure was back on us, this is where we do make those errors. This is where we have those mistakes. This is where we lose those drones. But if we just defended well for these very short windows, which it's not that hard to defend for a short window. It's hard to defend for an entire game and, and be a punching bag and be reacting the whole time. But reacting for just a small period is not hard. And then once the Mutalisks come out, once again, we should have map control. We should be in control. But <clears throat> we were a little bit greedy with moving our roaches all the way out to the watchtower, with not watching our overlords, even though our muters were in the perfect position, they were just spawning as that medevac came through our overlord. This was just us making basic errors. But think about it, if this didn't happen, and even after this happens, we're once again putting pressure on. We're forcing reactions, we're killing missile turrets, we're killing SCVs, we're doing damage, we're being really irritating. And we're forcing potential mistakes out of our opponent, we're forcing pressure. We're seeing his minerals floating up a bit there. He's got all of this anticipation of, crap, what the hell is Zerg going to do next? And whenever this is happening, look at our minimap. We don't feel pressured whatsoever. We can take risks. What do we have on the ground? <clears throat> right now, there's 17 Marines, a Marauder, a Siege Tank, two Liberators, all with Stim. Combat Shields is halfway done. One one's almost finished. What do we have? Four Roaches. Literally just four <laughs> Roaches. <laughs> And even if we hadn't taken that drone damage, yes, we'd have a lot more drones. Our third would be fully saturated. We'd be starting those upgrades already. That would be awesome. But we'd still only have four roaches. <clears throat> so that's something else we've got to always keep in mind. That ability to just be slightly uh, greedy. Whenever you're putting the pressure on your opponent, as long as you're building your economy behind it, you should always have time to then get your army units out. It's always pressure, economy, and then slightly delayed army. And if we just think about this from the Terran perspective, what information does Terran have? Upgrade. Luckily, he got those Hellion drops in. But other than that, he really doesn't know what's going on. Zerg is an enigma. Zerg is this whole area of what the hell's going on on the other side of the map. And no matter what matchup you're playing, <clears throat> whenever you're dealing with a lot of aggression, this is the scenario you find yourself in where you're going, what the hell is happening? If we watch from Igos' view, he's sending that Reaper out front. He doesn't know, is there going to be a big ground attack coming? He's trying to take down the rocks. He's very curious about what is going to happen next. And this gives you so much room to do creative things, to do different things, to just go out there <clears throat> and surprise your opponent and force them into those uncomfortable situations. So I definitely love this approach of waves of aggression, throwing our opponent off balance, trying to force mistakes. I think it's a very solid way to play StarCraft. Uh, I think it's a great way to play to simplify the game. 
Remember, you're trying to force reactions. <clears throat> the early roaches from us this game were really forcing, trying to force the Terran to respond. If we go back to that very early stage, we were hoping that he'd be very focused on the potential for a big roach attack, he'd be focused on getting marauders out, siege tanks, these sort of things. <clears throat> Unfortunately for us, Iagaz being a very experienced smart player said, I can get away without it. I don't need any of that stuff. He did look like he was about to start Banshee production though. <clears throat> and then he thinks better of it after clearing up that pressure and starts swapping his add-ons around. But we can see here he's already confused about what the hell, what's going on, what do I do from here? Starts building a medevac. But if he started building siege tanks at this point, if he started going overly defensive, that would really play into the hand of me playing Mutalisks. <clears throat> and that's exactly what we're going for with this style. Even though in the end it didn't work out, I think we, uh, we made what should have been a very one-sided series a lot closer than it otherwise would have been. <clears throat> mm. Alright guys, so that's going to um, conclude me looking through the games for the moment. I, I think we've pretty much summarized it up. It's really just about finding ways to put aggression on your opponent, have some neat timing attacks, and always have a good follow-up to a timing attack. Whether it just be pressure, pressure, and then a big all-in. Um, think about that game too. I think that's a, a not-too-hard-to-execute example. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think this game three takes a little bit more finesse, but basically it's just that idea of in game game number one, uh, game number two, sorry, rush mutalisks at an awkward timing, keep him busy, hit a big roach timing. Rather than just saying, I'm just going to mass a unit and go for one all in, <clears throat> having tiers and stages of pressure, I think almost always increases your chance of something working, throws your opponent off. Um, Likewise, you can always choose to do this the other way. You can choose to go for big pressure at an awkward timing, try to surprise your opponent, and you can follow that up by being exceptionally greedy. You can say, I'm going to pin him back and just go drone crazy or probe crazy, take a fast third nexus behind it, whatever race you're playing. And, and yes, there's a slight risk involved in that, but you can play that that way as well. And it's a way of simplifying the matchup. Um, <clears throat> because you're keeping your opponent at home, these risks really aren't as big. Because you're limiting their, their vision, the risk of going for just a big attack is not as bad. The risk of just playing very greedy is not as bad. The chances of your opponent making mistakes and falling apart under pressure, much, much higher. Chances of you making those normal mistakes you make when you're being dropped here and dropped there, much lower because the pressure's on your opponent. He doesn't have a chance to put that pressure onto you. <clears throat> oh my god, I said my throat was better. And apparently, just one pig daily, and it's already sounding worse. So let's take a look <clears throat> at some of those questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Brendan is hug, says pig. Use Mutus for Zerg. What would be a similar build that you could do for Terran? Of course, it always depends on the situation, uh, the matchup, your own strengths and styles. But I, if you're doing something where the first stage is like a, a pressure unit, something which is going to keep your opponent busy, Something which is very popular for Terran would be Hellions, Hellion Banshees, even Hellion drops to a lesser extent, um, but Widow Mine drops. So something you'll see quite a bit <clears throat> on, uh, on Korean ladder is Terran players who open up, whether it be very aggressive Hellions trying to do run buys. Often they'll follow that up with, okay, we'll, we'll pressure the front with Hellions, send a Medivac in the back and drop three Widow Mines in, in, in a mineral line. And you can do that against Protoss as well. It's a very similar sort of thing you can do against Protoss. Now, not every race has the same hypermobile units that they can get as much constant harass and scouting out of like Mutalisks, right? Mutalisks are like the, the perfect unit where you're just like, yay! You can't do that against Protoss though, as though, can you? Because they've got Phoenix. They've got a unit which shuts down the Mutas really hard. So you can't just be like, I'm just gonna build five Mutalisks, keep you super occupied and do that. If they haven't gone Stargate, then sure. Absolutely, yeah, you can, you can get out a small squad of Mutas force the phoenix and then hit a big hydralisk timing or hydralurk timing, something where the phoenix don't really matter as much against that, right? Um, but as a Terran player, you've got a lot of those options. Uh, another one is just opening up with a classic two or three racks play, where you go straight for a very fast factory and starport, where you skip Hellions or anything like that. You get two medevacs going, and then you start, you know, double dropping. You do a very fast double drop, you follow up with another double drop, and... <clears throat> Behind that, you can transition to something else. Um, in terms of if you really want to play this sort of weird compositional game, uh, the last one for Terran that I would suggest would be Sky Terran. So, 
Grill. Grill. Don't get too excited, guys. Um, see ya. <laughs> Uh, Sky Terran. Uh, you'll see a Terran player play that always with that sort of style where he's coming in from the side, sweet, right? Constant Hellion run buys coming in from different angles, trying to keep the opponent uh, on the back foot, do drone damage. Um, he's trying to trying to just kind of generally force, um, generally just force their opponent to like be very like, oh, what's happening? Defend, defend. Uh, maybe he's going mech, he's built so many Hellions. Oh shit, he's got eight Liberators and six Banshees or something like that. So there's a lot of different options. Definitely use your own creativity. Just have a think about what units work. The key is um, if you do a pressure, preferably you'd have mobile units, but you can still do ones like the three roach pressure I showed before. So you could just do something like, oh, I'm just going to do a stalker pressure versus Terran, where I just make five, six stalkers and a mothership core, and, or even just two, three stalkers. And I go to his ramp and try to kill depots. And then like I kind of back off after that when around the time I think Stim is going to be finishing. So there's lots of options available to you as a player, but um, definitely up to you guys to decide exactly how you want to make use of that knowledge. So I really want you guys to just be thinking about it and trying to analyze what you think uh, would be the best way to do it. Derek says, Terran has the Reaper aggression. Protoss says the Adept aggression is mute to the Zerg equivalent. Uh, it's kind of... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, not really, but I, in a vein, in a vein, yes. I think that if you think about it, right, like... Yeah, Adepts can kind of always get in in the very initial stage. The thing is, Adepts and Reapers, you know, they, they kind of peter out relatively quickly once the game progresses. I guess Adepts are always good against Terran, right? Um, until you get, like, really late game armies. But, um, yeah, they're very, like, default early game units. You don't need to commit a lot to get to them. In, in some ways, Zerg's equivalent to those units is Overlord sacrificing because, like, scouting is the main thing they get. And... It's more the threat of like speedlings and, and roaches early on. Um, but you don't get that same, I guess, default super fast scouting slash harassment unit. Um, yes, I am using my older webcam. I was saying it at the start of the stream. It's kind of crap. I do apologize. We're getting a new one because the other one was ruining. It was disconnecting my mic and mouse and basically just, just wreaking havoc upon my motherboard. Uh, what are the harass capabilities you see for Protoss and Blink Stalkers, Depths, or Immortal Drops and Oracles and Phoenixes? Or is that it already? Uh, DTs as well, Jockle. There's a lot of DT drop play where you can go in, drop the DT, kill a few workers, and then pick it up, even from in detection range with that ranged pickup. That's a really cool way to do it, but otherwise you've listed most of them. <clears throat> Jockle says one more question he says do you think it's always necessary to only do harass that corresponds to the tech that you chose we just can put a little bit of music on in the background because it's so quiet um or is it also good to deviate from that tech that synergizes very well with what you're doing so for example is it good to build a stargate even though you're going for a gateway robo army um as long as it's in one of your early waves, it's completely fine. You know, you don't want to necessarily like, like the thing is what, you, what, what you're thinking about is from your perspective. Does this synergize with my army? Now let's think about in these games we just did. Did Mutalisk synergize with Roaches? Hells no. Yes, they're good for shutting down harassment, which, which Roaches can't do. But in a Roach Ravager engagement, what, what do Mutalisks add? Mutalisks are just like, yeah, hey guys. And they just disappear to Marines. They do nothing in a Roach Ravager frontal engagement, right? So likewise, if you're opening up oracles, but you're planning to do an immortal uh, adapt all in afterwards, that's fine. Yeah, the oracle is not there to necessarily help in the all in. It can give a bit of high ground vision, bit of detection. It's all about the harassing earlier than that, scouting before that, leading into the attack. So it's something we're definitely opening up with. Like I, I do like your thinking though, the idea of opening up with an oracle, putting pressure on, following up with a, a gateway immortal all in. That's, that's something which sounds like a good idea. That's the sort of thing we're going for here. Put pressure on them, try to keep them off balance a little bit, hit them with a big attack. Really good way to simplify the game. All right, guys, I think that's, um, I think that's about it. One last question from CS Angori. He says, Pig, how do you know how many units do you need for the early pressure to be effective? All depends on the situation, your own game. We saw that game, those three roaches, didn't do that much. Find a build you like, whether from copying someone else, watching a pro game, or make it up yourself. Experiment and figure it out. It all comes down to the metagame, what builds people are doing, how they read and react to your play. 
Every situation is different, every skill level is different. StarCraft's a complex game. Unfortunately, as much as I love to give you guys examples of what you can put into practice, that's one where I feel there's just so many options available to you. It's not set in stone. It's all about you to go out there, hop on ladder, explore, figure it out. So I think that's going to wrap it up for today, guys. I do want to say a big thanks for hanging out. Um, everyone who's watching on YouTube as well as Twitch, thanks. Do consider following or liking, subscribing, whatever. Um, yeah, I apologize for missing yesterday's one, but I have some really cool new show concepts uh, which are being planned at the moment. So be excited for pro game show matches. We're going to be hopefully getting one going this week. Already got one almost locked in for next week. Um... Basically, we're going to be doing it where pro gamers play each other and then we they play a game, we hop out of the game, I say to the loser, what the hell went wrong, buddy? He tells me what he thinks went wrong and then we recover the replay from just before he made the crucial decision-making error or the crucial micro error. And we play it out differently. At the end of that game, whichever way it goes, we get both players in the chat together and we just have a discussion about the matchup, what went on in the games, and, and what happened. So we're going to be getting that going um, at least once a week, hopefully. We're also going to be starting to do some more newbie-friendly ones. So if you guys are bronze, silver, gold, even if you're plat or diamond, please, I need replays of you getting cheesed or cheesing. I want successful early attack. It doesn't have to be the most cheesy attack. It could be any early attack, anything which is hitting you before five, six minutes, that sort of time. Please send me those replays to pigrandom88 at gmail.com. If you're in Twitch chat, I will link my email there. Um, I need those because I want to be doing a few uh, a kind of newbie episode every week. And I think the perfect one to start with is how do I defend cheese? How do I defend early attacks? And I w want to basically go through a range of replays of different skill levels, looking at what the players should be focusing on more, how they can kind of shore up their play and stop themselves dying from that. So you can help me out by sending me those replays. Um, that's it, guys. Thank you for hanging out. Don't forget to hug a cactus, lick a walrus, and of course, punch a penguin in the cankle. That's all for now, guys. Goodbye and good night.